Hi there. Today I'm going to be reading you some excerpts from the book, If You Must Speculate, Learn the Rules. I'm just going to skim over this with you. It's only 97 pages. Uh, it was written or published in 1930, just after the crash of 1929. So, I think some lessons you can learn from this uh, book, for one, is, you know, they're coming out of a crash. And so, you know, what's the mindset at that time after so much money was lost, okay? It, it was amazing to me when I read this that a lot of the terminology is the same today as it was almost a hundred years ago. Uh, they, they list words they use and we today can identify with a lot of them. All right, uh, some other words or term terminology have since changed, but basically mean the same thing. I was also surprised to know, I just didn't do the research, that they, they had options back then too. So uh, options contracts, um, probably a little different than what they are today, or, you know, obviously not as easy to get in and out of as they w once were, or are easier to get in and out of now than they once were. Um, so anyway, let's, uh, let's take a look at this together. All right. All right, so. It was written by Frank J. Williams. Now, I tried to do some research on him, and a Frank J. Williams is predominant on Google. Uh, he was a, a former Supreme Court justice. Recent. Okay, so it's not the same guy. But... Um, this was published in 1930. So we'll just start with the forward. It was generally believed that the market crash of 1929 taught the speculative public such a severe lesson that a generation would pass before a new crop of speculators grew up. But you might as well tell Americans not to breathe as not to speculate. They are at it again, writing into newspapers, tipping, tipping agencies, and broker's offices, asking the same old questions and eager for tips. Interest in stocks is growing daily. It is time to stop preaching to the smaller speculators and make an attempt to teach them to ro the ropes. After all, there is no reason why they should not speculate if they can afford it. Whether we tell them they may or may not, they will anyway. Let us give them a sporting chance. We are a gambler. We are gam We are all gamblers at heart. We cannot be blamed for wanting to get at the best things in life in the quickest possible way. This is the spirit of America. The stock market seems to offer the most rapid road to fortune. The creed of the new speculator is: I want to make a lot of money on little capital in a short time without working for it. This is just as impossible in Wall Street as it is in any other place. Money can be made in speculation on the stock market, but it is made slowly and only by a thoughtful and deliberate course of action. The quick profits are just froth. They arouse a fever in the blood and don't last. The worst things that can happen to a new speculator is to make a lot of quick money on his first trade. Haphazard dabbling in stocks by amateur traders undoubtedly is dangerous. The odds are all in favor of losing money. The risks can be greatly reduced if the trader only would make some attempt to learn the rules of the game. Driving an automobile is dangerous, and few people attempt it without first learning something of the mechanism of a car. But any death dealing machine can be made safe <clears throat> through knowledge of its working parts and possibilities. The stock market undoubtedly is a death dealing machine to hundreds of thousands of people financially, but only because they have yet to learn how to operate it. New speculators are eager to, eager to learn how to make money in Wall Street. They should first try to learn how to protect the capital they already possess. That's important. They should first try to learn how to protect the capital they already possess. 
The methods used by wealthy men to protect their millions can just as easily be used by small speculators to protect their hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars. I believe a trader first starts to make money in the market when he realizes that he is winning and losing actual money. While he surveys his operations only as paper transactions, they mean little. The average man would be shocked if he lost a thousand dollars in cash from his pocket. It does not seem so serious when he does not actually handle the money. The men who have rolled up fortunes in the street can't give you rules for accumulating wealth. I have interviewed dozens of the biggest operators and I have always asked them in vain for a formula. Most of the get rich schemes in Wall Street are not workable for the person who has other business to attend to. So if you have a full-time job, you don't want to get into a trading strategy where you have to be watching the market all the time. Uh, I have a full-time job. Um, and let me tell you, I've been, I've only been doing this for April, 2020. I'm, I'm thinking got in a little, I guess a, a good time after the 2020 crash, if you will. Uh, but as with a lot of new traders to the scene, I played a lot of options. Okay. And, um, I have just basically recently changed my strategy. Um, I may dabble in options here and there, but it's very rare and I don't make much. And if I do, I set a stop loss so I don't, I don't lose much. But 95% of my activity since April 20th, so on 420, was my last option. I think I did an option after that, but I only made 88 cents, so no big deal. Um, so I've changed my strategy. So now 90%, 95%, or even 98% of my activity is just accumulating. I'm just accumulating shares. Um, I try to only buy on red days, but I am guilty of buying on green days. Um, you know, if, if you buy on red days now, one of my, I have six positions. One of my positions is a fintech company and my average at one point was over $8 and the price has fallen to $2 and change at the moment. Um, so I've been averaging down and now I am below six dollars. Uh, one shared time, you know, unless it's a great cheap price, like, you know, if it's 234 today and it's been trading in the range of 215 and 234, 240, kind of going this way, uh, if I can get in at 215, great, but I haven't had that opportunity recently, okay? But you, you would want to buy at the low end of the range, if possible. Anyway, so options, I, I wasted a lot of money on options, okay? I will say, you know, basically you're gambling, okay? So sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. And uh, when I had opened my Think or Swim account, I had deposited $100. And within four or five days, I had it up to $1,000. So I had, in, it had increased it from $100 to $1,000 on swinging shares of, uh, you know, uh, hot movers, top, top of the gainers list, you know, where, wherever, wherever the FOMO was, uh, I would trade it and plus then options um so like an idiot i took that thousand dollars and bought a tesla call for a thousand dollars without now this is probably over a year ago i'm going to say six months into my trading i did the stupidity 
I didn't bother to look at any news or if there's any upcoming earnings or anything when I bought it. And it turns out, earnings came out that afternoon after close. And it must not have been a good one because all I remember is my $1,000 premium. I ended up selling the next day at $400. So I had lost $600 out of that 1000 So, man, that was a big lesson there. I mean, I was high up to 1000 and then crashed. Anyway. The men who have rolled up fortunes in the street can't give you rules for accumulating wealth. I have interviewed dozens of biggest operators. Making money in the stock market depends largely on the speculator's ability to obey certain common sense rules. This book has no get-rich scheme to offer. It hopes to put a red beacon light at the holes new margin traders are certain to fall into. Now, it, it, this, this talks about margin trading. Also, I don't do any margin trading. Uh, I only I only play with money that I can afford to lose. All right, I'm not borrowing money to lose it uh, potentially. So I don't do any margin trading. But it does go into some mar margin trading trading uh, information. So information is available to all today that only millionaires could get some years ago. Now, see, even in 1930 information was getting better for them than previous. So just imagine how far we've come since 1930. I mean, information is at your fingertips. All you got to do is is do a little research and you, you, you'll have an answer in minutes. Whereas back in the day, it took a long time. It took days to get information. Uh... If speculators refuse to seek this information and refuse to obey the rules of Wall Street, they have nobody to blame but themselves if they come to grief. Information is so easily obtainable today that there should be no lambs in Wall Street. Many speculators playing the market know all the facts herein presented, but they still persist in breaking the rules, gambling on the million of one chance that they will be lucky. They will be the lucky ones to make quick fortunes without working for them. The market teaches many a lesson of life, and it undoubtedly a hard master. One of its great commandments is, Thou shalt not get something for nothing. Thou shalt not get something for nothing. For every dollar earned in the stock market, you must give a dollar's worth of time and thought. The market delights to catch the speculator in a careless or reckless mood. If you are intelligent, now that is true. The market delights to catch the speculator in a careless or reckless mood. I don't know how many trades I've entered recklessly without really thinking about it of companies that I really had no interest in. And uh, generally it was, you know, FOMO. Or you saw a pattern where you thought, if I get in here, I can just swing it and end up losing. <clears throat> if you are intelligent, the market will teach you Caution and fortitude sharpen your wits and reduce your pride. If you are foolish and refuse to learn a lesson, it will ridicule, ridicule you. Excuse me. It will riddle, ridicule you, laugh you to scorn, break you, and toss you onto the rubbish heap. The stock market is cruel, but it is glorious, representing all that we admire in the American character courage, vitality, forethought, vision, and enterprise. That was the foreword by Frank Williams. Some standard stocks listed on the New York Stock Exchange as of 1930. So we'll see how many on this list are still in, in existence. Some companies may have changed names and still exist. I don't know. But uh, we have a few on the list that are still around, but only a few, and there's probably 40 on the list. Allied Chemical and Dye, American Can, American Power and Light, American Radiator, American Smelting, American Telephone and Telegraph, American Tobacco, Anaconda Copper, Atchison Railroad, Baldwin Locomotive, 
Bethlehem Steel, Borden Company, Canadian Pacific Railroad, Consolidated Gas, Corn Products, Delaware and Hudson Railroad, Eastman Kodak, General Electric, General Motors, International Telephone and Telegraph, Kennecott Copper, National Biscuit, National Leave, New York Central, North American Company, Otis Elevator, Paramount, Pennsylvania Railroad, Public Service of New Jersey, Pullman Corporation, Radio Corporation of America, Standard Brands, Standard Oil of New Jersey, Texas Corporation, United Gas Improvement, Union Pacific, United States Steel, Westinghouse Electric, and Woolworth. All right, so you need not be a millionaire to make money in the stock market. It is possible for the small man in Wall Street to make money and to continue to make money. Over a period of years, he can build up a comfortable stake if he obeys the rules followed by the big fellows. This means that he must be careful with his five hundred or five thousand dollars as the rich man is with his millions. He must view the stock market as a big business to be treated seriously and not as a betting arena. He must be prepared to give a great deal of his time to a study of big business. The information used by wealthy men as a basis of operations in the stock market is today public property available to all. Thousands of experts are anxious to help the small man build up his capital. Now, let's see. Men with the smallest amount of capital value money least. The rich man watches his dollars carefully. His poorer brother feels that his small amount is not worth conserving. This theory is true in ordinary life and particularly true in Wall Street. The average small trader takes a flyer in the market without forethought. Now a flyer is uh, something that's gone bananas, uh, like a meme stock. Okay, Back then <coughs> it was referred to as a flyer because it's flying. All right. Okay. The average small trader takes a flyer in the market without forethought on the theory that if he does, that if he loses, he is not much out. Gambling in stocks in this happy-go-lucky hit-or-miss style, used by hundreds of thousands, is a hopeless waste of time and money. The stock market is not a Monte Carlo. It is an important part of the nation's life. Through it flows the money that keeps the wheels of industry turning. When you buy stock, you have acquired the privilege of participating in big business. You are owning part of that company. You're not just buying a, you know, a chip at a poker table. Uh, the more stocks, the more shares you own in, <clears throat> in a company, uh, the more important you, your, your vote will be. I mean, it doesn't really matter big or small amounts, but I, I, I would assume those that have a majority stake in a company have bigger sway. But regardless, companies, some companies take votes on certain things, and you have a right to vote on certain things, should something come up. So you can play an active role in the company of which you are investing. Why buy stock without investigation? You would not buy a house without having the title searched. Speculators using as much common sense in buying stock as in buying a house or a car would have nothing to fear in the stock market. The first thing the small trader in Wall Street must do is to rid his mind of the treasure hunting idea and get down to business, big business. Don't be ashamed of your few hundred dollars or thousands. The large corporations need your small capital and they will pay you well for the loan. Okay, margin the minimum. There's nothing wrong in margin trading. It is a perfectly legitimate method of doing business very much abused. Margin trading actually is in use in all lines of business. You buy a house on margin. In the stock market, margin trading is recognized as a necessary part of, a stock, of stock distribution. The sale of stock is absolutely necessary 
to the economic growth of the country. 90% of the business done on the stock exchange is for, for margin accounts. So this was in 1930. I don't know what the statistic is today, but 90% seems like an awful lot on margin. 75% of those using this method in the purchase of stock lose money. Why? Because the margin trader forgets that his margin is the minimum capital he can do business on and that he might be asked to put up more money. He has no reserves and his forces are wiped out in the first attack. More than a minimum amount of capital is required in any business if success is to be assured. The average Wall Street trader takes advantage of the margin system to stretch his resources to the limit. He pushes his ship all along with, uh, with all canvas spread, taking no pains to keep a weather, uh, weather eye open. Success in margin trading in stocks is in proportion to the care and thought given to it by speculators. The average small trader does not think. He bets, depending largely on luck and tips, and he always overbuys. Speculation in stocks is in itself an exacting profession to which men give their lives. It is a risky sideline. Between an ordinary business and the stock market, the latter is certain to pull the stronger. Make speculation a servant, not a master. Those who dabble carelessly in the market pay dearly for their thrills. Men have been known to turn small margin accounts into fairly large fortunes quickly. They had to quit their regular jobs to do it. One cannot serve two masters. Trading on margin is the easiest and quickest way to make or lose money in the stock market. Hence its popularity in America where people demand a kick with investments. That's why people freak out. You know, say, you know, you hear about people jumping out of windows and jumping off of bridges, you know, because... Uh, you know, they made a bad choice. Um, now, if I were to just spend all the money I had in my savings account on a stock and it nosedived and I lost everything, uh, that would be one thing. I mean, would I commit suicide? I don't know. But I will say, maybe those that you know, borrow money on margin, like way too much money. You know, say you borrow $100,000 or a million dollars, and God forbid, I, how would a small guy like me get that kind of money? Probably not. <clears throat> but, so you borrow $100,000 and you have to put 25% down, so you pay them I guess 25 grand. So you, you know, say you had 25 grand in savings and you put that down on this $100,000 loan and you make a wrong bet and it takes a dump and the brokerage wants their money because the bank wants their money. So where do you get $75,000 from if you just spent all your 25,000? So now, not only are you out of money, you owe three times that. That's probably where people get into killing themselves. I don't know. Okay, here we go. Here's a good one. Where do you belong? Are you an investor, a speculator, or a trader? It is very important that you are classified before opening an account at the broker's. A different technique is used in each of the three groups. Many people who want to be investors but degenerate into day-to-day -day traders or gamblers because there is nobody to guide them. The belief is almost universal that speculation in stocks means as many transactions as possible. This belief keeps the brokers busy, but it is fallacious. The savings of the nation should be permitted to flow evenly into business. This process goes by various names, and the people who lend money to industry are placed in different classes. The two broad classifications are investment and speculation, but these terms are elastic. An investor is one who buys sound securities where he knows his principal will be safe, and he will get a fair income return on his money. The speculator is he who buys today with the hope of selling tomorrow or next month at a higher price. The terms investment and speculation 
cover many subdivisions of financial practice. The investor may buy a semi-speculative security, which in plain English means a security with all the earmarks of safety, yet with a known risk. A speculator may study conditions as carefully as an investor, or he may be a day-to-day -day trader who is an ordinary gambler or gamester. A large majority of those who buy stocks in Wall Street belong to the latter class, whether they know it or not. If you belong in the investment class, don't set out to buy stocks on margin. If you have an exacting business of your own, don't try to be an active day-to-day tra day -day trader. If you believe yourself qualified to become an active gambler, be sure you know the ropes and be, be prepared to lose. Don't be vague and uncertain. If you can't make up your mind, somebody will make it up for you. Stay away from Wall Street until you are absolutely certain in your own mind that you are doing the right thing. If you go around asking people what you should do, you will run into somebody who deliberately or innocently will give you wrong advice. This will mean months of discouragement before you find yourself again. Who may speculate? Fortune is fickle and deserts the person who needs her most urgently. The man or woman who cannot afford to lose should leave speculation alone. You cannot afford to lose if you need the money for other purposes. Okay, so don't turn into that that person that goes to the, the, the horse race track and spends rent money. All right, that is not what you want to do. If you've got extra money, if you've got some savings, and what I did was, now I'm 50, and I just started a 401k four years ago uh, when I started with this company that I'm at now. And I had no 401k up until that point because I just didn't see the need for some, you know, I was young and I didn't think about it till too late or till later. Anyway, so I was putting back 10%, 5%. The company match is 3% but only a half a percent per every per one percent you put in. So for every one percent I put in, the company will put in a half a percent. So in order for me to max out the match, I'd have to put in six percent and they put in three percent. So I did so that's what I was doing recently. And then what I decided to do was drop it to three percent. And then that difference that 3%, I wasn't contributing to my 401k. I was putting into my brokerage account and buying stocks on my own. So I can afford to do that, okay? that That's my, my pre-tax money. Well, I guess I'm taking after-tax money out. So I'm taking my after-tax money out and buying stocks of my own, 3% of my gross weekly income. So whether I work overtime or not, 3% uh, goes into 401k, 3% goes into my brokerage account. Currently I have six positions. I don't want to, you know, 12 positions for a couple of reasons. It's too much to watch. Uh, I look at it too much already. A uh, second reason is if you're only putting a percentage of your gross income per week in it's not a lot okay so if I put in 50 bucks um, I got to spread that 50 bucks out and unless I use you know so I can buy a little bit of everything at a time that I choose now what I, I want to get really good at is is really only adding to stocks when the price has fallen below what I have figured to be the true value. So say I've figured a, the true value of a stock is $10. If I can get it for $8, I'll buy it then. I don't want to buy it at $11. I don't want to buy it at $12. Um, so I usually only buy on red days. I try not to buy on green days, but I, I do, uh, on a dip, you know. Uh, let's see. Okay.
The whole secret of success in stock market speculation is picking good stocks, buying them at a reasonable price, and staying with them. The wealthy man need never lose because if he makes a mistake and buys at the wrong time, he can take up his stock, pay for it outright, meaning he had it on margin, pay for it outright, and put it away for years if necessary and just sit on it. The smaller trader who cannot afford to lose might use good judgment and pick a good stock, but he cannot stay with it. <clears throat> he should not buy any stock in the first place because he is not in a position to pay for it outright. In an extended decline, when the market is driven down below levels of actual values, the small trader's resources are, are all used up and he is sold out by the broker, usually right at the turning point. So, and that happens even today, if you read this again. In an extended decline of stock price, when the market is driven down below levels of actual value, so say the actual value is 10 bucks, and in times like today, or the last, since January of 22, we've been sliding downward, and now we're below actual value of a lot of companies. And if you're on margin, okay, and you bought at a higher price, and the price is going down, the banks get nervous, they put pressure on the broker to send you a margin call, which is right here. The small trader's resources are all used up and he is sold out by the broker. So meaning the broker uh, sold him out and, and it's usually right at the turning point, right? right usually right before it has a reversal and goes back up. So people get screwed out and then it's okay. We see it happening all the time. It happens to me or it used to happen to me. Uh, it is a heartbreaking, it is heartbreaking to hold a stock all through a break in the market, knowing that there will come a time when you cannot put up any more margin and clinging like a drowning man to the hope that something will happen to save you. That something rarely happens by order of some inex ex inex inexorable fate. The market seems to decline far enough to get your last dollar and then rebounds. <laughs> this does not happen to you alone, but to hundreds of thousands of people. Professional Wall Street, shrewd and calculating, knows that the market is full of traders who cannot afford to speculate. Their speculations are called weak holdings. When the stock market is puffed up by the speculation of a large number of inexperienced traders who will become panic-stricken at the first sign of trouble, it is said that sh stocks are in weak hands. We use weak hands all the time. They used it back then. Uh, air traders figure out fairly accurately how far the market will have to be driven down to exhaust the resources of the weak traders. They have no personal animosity towards the small traders. It is a matter of business. The bearer lives by catching the stock market in a weak position and depressing it further. I added further. Um, he makes his profits on declines. He knows that in certain circumstances by his speculative selling, he can stampede the herd of frightened amateur speculators who will do the rest of his work for him. When the last week account has been wiped out, the bear will cover and the market rebounds. Listen, the bear, the hedge funds, they, they know where the shares are. They know, you know, they probably know if you're a small trader or a big trader, they know how many shares you have. Uh, and really, yeah, if, if they've got that, that information, they know who's got this at like what average, and if they're on margin, and they'll, they'll know where that price needs to go for the brokerage, uh, uh, your brokerage to, 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 call, to call you on a margin call, they know how far they have to go. It's really unfair. So you just have to play the game. The 
hundreds of thousands of small speculators who are wiped out in every minor swing of the stock market believe they are victims of fate and that their losses are accidental. The disaster is a matter of cause and effect. They cannot afford to lose and therefore are certain to lose. If they could buy their stock outright when occasion arose, these margin traders could defy the bearers and help turn the tables on them. The great majority of small traders break the fundamental rules of the stock market and they can win only by accident. One reason it was so hard to break the speculative bubble of 1928 and 1929 was that traders were gambling on large margins. But the bears got them in the end, and in the whirlwind decline of the fall of 1929, the largest margin was not adequate. Only those who could buy their stock outright, if necessary, weathered the storm. A person has no right to speculate in securities unless he is an a short, in an assured position. Men and women certainly should not speculate until they have paid the landlord, the butcher, and the tailor. They should have no doctor bills or insurance premiums overdue. Um, let's see. There is no reason why women should not speculate if they keep their heads and use their own money. Now, you got to remember, this is 1930, so uh, women weren't as far along as they are today. It was found in the big crash of 1929 that large numbers of women were gambling with their husband's money. This practice is unsound. The greatest weakness in amateur speculators is that they don't properly value their own money. They are likely to value even less money they don't earn. It is not hard to imagine that the practice of a married woman gambling in stocks with money given to her by her husband for household or other purposes is likely to cause great domestic unhappiness. Um, Small tradesmen are pathetic specimens of stock speculators. They generally lose both ways in the market and at the store because of neglect. The small tradesman, as a rule, has to work in the store from near early morning until late at night. His is a life of drudgery. He, his profits are small and he piles up capital slowly and only by the greatest thrift and economy. He is not in a position to make a study of stocks and he should not speculate. Retail tradesmen were in the market in large numbers at the time of the Great uh, Crash of 1929, and they had bought mostly on the tips brought to their stores by customers and traveling salesmen. One exception to this rule is a baker I know, who has built up a comfortable fortune out of a very small beginning, but he is a real speculator and not a gambler. He waits patiently for the periodical bear market to come round, and he will wait for year years. Then when he believes Stocks are at the very bottom. He goes down to the brokerage house and buys a line of stocks he has studied and has been watching for a long time. He buys the stocks outright and then forgets them and goes back to baking. He may hold these stocks for three or four years, but when he sells them, he does so with substantial profits. So that's, that's a strategy I would like to really get disciplined in, and that is to really only buy on downturns. Now, of course, if, if that's a strategy I held, then I would have got in in 2020, March of 2020. Uh, would have got in, you know, we may have had a couple other breaks in, in the long rally that you would have got in. Certainly now, uh, end of June 22, heading into July, last week of June, uh, we've been heading down since January. Uh, we started coming back up a little bit. Uh, last week, I think we had five red days. I meant to say five green days. Um, at least my portfolio did. Um, uh, economic data came out today uh, that wasn't all that great. So uh, we're in the red today. So where is the bottom? You don't know. All you can really do is dollar cost average. Uh, just buy a little bit, you know, at a time. Don't throw all your eggs in one basket. If you got money to carry over till tomorrow, carry some money over, some, some cash over till tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow you'll have a better opportunities. Maybe it'll be another red day. You know, maybe it'll be a worse red day. If it's a green day, carry the money over till the next day. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, let's see. I talk about character and, and stocks. Um, information, tips, don't take tips. You need facts. You gotta, you gotta look at facts. 
you, you can't uh, you can't go on tips. I try not to give any tips. I really do. I just I try to um, people at work. You know, uh, two years ago nobody at work traded stocks. Uh, now I've got um, three or four people I work with that trade stocks, and they've lost money. Uh, the last six months they've they've lost money um and and i told them you know number one don't play earnings because the one guy put all this kit and caboodle in um oh, shit i can't remember and he lost 50 percent now he's probably still holding it but it's going to be a while it, you don't just don't play earnings especially in these times Good Lord. I mean, everyone's going to be missing. Well, not everybody. A lot of companies are going to be missing. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. The mysterious pool. The whisper goes around the street. The pool is buying or the pool is selling a certain stock. And speculators look wise and rush in to follow the mysterious force they know nothing about. Following pool operations is a dangerous practice because... The sole aim of most pools is to make stocks attractive to buyers at fictitious prices. Pools represent organized speculation and manipulation, and their sole aim is to unload stock on the public. While pools are careful not to break any of the bylaws of the stock exchange, their operations represent professional Wall Street at its worst. While a pool is buying stock, it will do all in its power to encourage selling, and when it wants to resell the public, resell to the public, it will go to great lengths to attract buyers. Some pools are thoroughly dishonest and will not hesitate to circulate false rumors and to manufacture news. Nothing has changed. They do the same thing today. Nothing has changed. Uh, so for the small trader, you've got a lot of history to learn from. Look, striking it rich immediately is just gambling. It very, very rarely happens. It's like playing the lottery. If you want to come out a winner, that might be 10 years down the road. It might be 15 years down the road. Meanwhile, you're watching over time how you are profiting or will be profiting from your decisions. Uh, I just wish I would have started earlier. Um, all I can say is if you're young, learn, you know, obviously learn, uh, learn about the stock market before you get into it. Uh, you have to educate yourself. If you want it to work, you have to educate yourself. I am still learning. I've, like I said, I've only been doing this for a little over two years. It seems like longer than that. It really does. I mean, we've been through a lot. Uh, COVID. Um, now we're in, a, you know, inflation and high gas prices. And uh, last year, the companies were hiring out the ass. And now they're firing. They're laying people off in such a quick amount of time, you know, eight months, nine months, it's going from begging for people to come apply to cutting staff in less than a year. It's just, it blows my mind. I, it's happened before, but you know, I wasn't thinking about any of this crap. A pool is a combination of men with capital who use their joint resources in a market operation in the belief that they can control the price by their buying and selling of a stock or group of stocks. Sometimes there is a flimsy excuse for the formation of a pool. Its members may be in possession of advanced knowledge of developments pending in the affairs of a certain corporation that will make its stock worth more or less. Now, that obviously is insider trading, which is illegal. 
but like it never happens, right? You're damn right it happens. It happens every day. It is what it is. That's why I don't play earnings. Uh, let's see. Because they can fake you out. They can take that, that, that stock price to the moon. Okay? And of course you're going to get on late. And... It's a trap. Okay? And, uh... It's a bear trap coming. Because earnings come out and they're terrible. And the price freaking drops. And now all the traders that got in on the way uh, to the top to the to the top of that rally, all the traders that jumped on in FOMO are now hopefully getting out even. Uh, but probably not. Because generally then, it, I would assume the way it would work is they would rally the price up and just before the news came out, they would start selling at the higher price and profiting. And then the price starts to go down, right? They get out where all, all the other retail traders are still in. And then the news comes out that it's bad and then everyone starts dumping. So ho hopefully the news comes out with the price is still up above where they got in because if they get if, if if not they're taking a loss. But earnings are funny. You could have good earnings, price goes down. Probably because the price was inflated. You have bad earnings, price goes up. Maybe because it wasn't as bad as it was you suppose thought it was going to be, or maybe the bad earnings was already priced in prior to earnings coming out. Should a pool know of coming favorable developments, it will first try to depress the stock to buy it at low prices. Then, when the good news comes out, and the stock is a natural advance, it will sell out to the public. If the news to come is unfavorable, the pool will try to boost the stock to high prices to unload and then go short of it. So, if they know news coming out is unfavorable, they'll artificially work on raising the stock price before the earnings come out. You get to a certain level on that rally that they feel comfortable with and sell out and then they enter a short position so when the bad news comes out and the stock tanks they can profit from shorting the stock they do it today i mean nothing has changed either he is okay in both cases, the uninformed speculator is the victim. Either he is discouraged and shaken out of a good stock it would be profitable to hold, or he is lured into the market to buy stock that is riding for a, for a fall. The operations of a pool, all carried out under cover, are deceptive and treacherous, even if they are not actually dishonest. Pool managers take advantage of ignorant speculators. Um... Okay. They're very cleverly organized and handled. The managers make a thorough study of the stock they intend to operate in and never shoot in the dark. But uh, before placing orders to buy or sell, they have figured out almost to a penny the value of the stock in certain circumstances. They establish a maximum price they will pay for the stock and they will resort to various devices to obtain stock at or under that price. A careful checkup is made by the pool of the whereabouts of every share of stock of the corporation involved. Who's holding the stock? Who's holding the stock? 
with the aid of stockholders lists easily obtainable they know how much stock is in strong hands and how much is in weak hands they know what stock is likely to come out of strong boxes in case of a rise and what stock will not come to market then the amount of stock floating in wall street is ascertained what's available if after all these carefully laid plans unexpected stock does come to market wait if after all these carefully laid plans unexpected stock does come to market okay so an unexpected stock that they didn't think was going to be sold the pool will back away until it has discovered where the stock is coming from if the selling is from an important source the operation may be dropped if it is unimportant the pool will let the stock decline until all the shares offered have been absorbed at low prices so well do most pool managers know the whereabouts of various blocks of stock that they can detect in a minute any unexpected offerings it takes a little time for them to trace the source of a sale uh, there's there's a term that I saw on here called shaking the tree so you know it okay so they know how much stock is in strong hands and how much is in weak hands so shaking the tree you're, you're basically shaking the weak hands out of the tree all right uh, I had, hadn't heard that term before, but it makes sense. Um, sentimentality and stocks don't mix. A sentimental person is likely to place too much trust in a friend or relative. He will be certain that Mr. X would not give him a bad tip. Don't take tips. Uh, the board fly. It is unhealthy for the outside speculator to hang around Wall Street. There are too many temptations to buy and sell. Once having given his order, the speculator should go back to work and forget the market. He should not encourage his broker to telephone him every time the market changes. These scraps of information unsettle the mind and cause doubts. That's why we shouldn't look at the market every day if we're long term. I do it over a dozen times, probably 50 times a day I look at it. It's just a habit I got into, um, along with uh, <clears throat> looking at this uh, Discord channel I'm a member of. Um, I'm on it all the time, um, but hey, you know, it is what it is. It's my hobby. Um, I'm not worried. All right. I'm down. My portfolio is down 36%. Uh, one of my positions, positions is down 60%, sometimes 50%. Uh, but you know, it's not money I need. And that position, uh, I do believe, will, will benefit me in the long run. So I'm not worried about it. So looking at it every day doesn't give me heartburn. I don't stay up late at night because I didn't throw a lot of money into it. I mean, honestly, I didn't throw a lot of money into it. I, only, I don't even have 200 shares of something, and my average is $5.87. So it's not like I'm going to lose the house, okay? It's just a little bit of money I put in there over time. I dollar cost averaged. Um, and so if my average is 587 and I'm going to I'm gonna keep buying until I get to 200 shares, uh, then I think I'll probably stop again because I had stopped at 100 for a while. And now I'm up to about 150. So I got 50 more shares. Current share price is $2.30. So, <clears throat> you know, getting to a 200 isn't going to break the bank. It's not going to take forever. A couple more weeks, you know. I'm not in a hurry because the market ain't going anywhere. Um, don't get a joint account with somebody. Not sure why you would want to do that. Uh, discretionary account discretionary uh, discretionary account is when you give your broker discretion over your, your money um, and I think he states pretty plainly here or at least underneath one of the rules one of the golden rules here let me look uh, let's back. Um, don't 
don't buy in a hurry. There is plenty of time to buy good stocks. I just said that. Um, let's see. Don't give, don't, don't give a broker discretionary powers. If you can't run your own account, leave the market alone. Because you, you'll, you'll, you'll do better for yourself. It's your money. If, if you're informed, if you stay informed, if you do the research, if you, if you do your due diligence, uh, <clears throat> you'll have a better record than the broker. Because essentially, that's what mutual funds are, right? I mean, for the most part, right? And the brokers decide what stocks are in that fund with your money. Create your own mutual fund. Uh, it talks about opening a brokerage account. Now, here's a term I had never heard before. Odd lots. Odd lots is a uh, number of shares below 100. Uh, buying in amounts less than a round lot of 100 shares constitute a large part of the daily business on the stock exchange. Uh, if you, so, they refer to it as a 10-share trader. If you are a 10-share trader, don't be ashamed of it. Three large houses in the street act as dealers in odd lots buying from and selling to other brokerage houses. They maintain a large corporation, of, uh, large core of brokers on the floor of the stock exchange. Uh, if, you, if you learn to creep with odd lots, so if you creep along buying less than 100 shares at a time, um, you may be able to fly someday with a much larger account. If you overbuy at the start, you will cripple yourself financially. So say a stock is $10 and I only have a hundred bucks and I buy the stock at $10. I buy 10 shares and then the stock goes down to $9. Uh, shit, I'm done 10 bucks. Then it goes down to $8. Now I'm down 20 bucks. I don't have any more money. Uh, you're crippled. You just crippled yourself. An odd lot order given to your broker is subject to the same rules that govern a thousand share order, except that the odd lot trader has to pay an eighth or a quarter of a point more for his stock than the buyer of a round lot. Your broker will pass the odd lot order on to an odd lot house for execution. I assume that's just a fee. Odd lot trader has to pay an eighth or a quarter of a point more for his stock than the buyer of a round lot. Uh, well bought is half sold. Speculators, as a rule, pay too much for their stock in the first place. In the words of Wall Street, they have a poor market position. The average venture into the street in search of profits usually revolves, resolves itself into a long drawn out fight to get out of the market with a whole skin. At this minute, there are hundreds of thousands of speculators praying for stocks to return to the prices they paid for them. It is a good bet that these unfortunate traders never will wait for that time, but will sell at a loss. It is an equally good bet that the market will not advance far enough for these traders to sell at a profit while it knows of the overhanging weak stock. Hmm. It is an equally good bet that the market will not advance far enough for these traders to sell at a profit while it knows of the overhanging weak stock. Now, that makes me think of the of the the graph on my brokerage account that um, it tells you what the average average held stock price is and what the stock price is now so when you look at that you see if if the majority of of holders are holding over the current stock price that that average will be above the stock price the current stock price so that that could be one way that the market makers that's probably a price they don't want to get above so say a stock's trading at 250 and the average price is 325 they want to do what they can to keep 
the stock price from going over 325 because that's when the bulk of traders are going to dump. Let's see. Okay, here we get to some good stuff. <laughs> the pools and professional operators go to a lot of trouble loading the public with stock at inflated prices. They are not disposed to take the stock back at those prices. The only chance one lamb has to get out even or better is to find another lamb to sell to. This might happen in a rampant bull market when large numbers of tyros whatever that is, are in the market buying anything in sight at any price. A man goes into the market in search of a quick profit and gets hooked with a quick loss is known as an involuntary investor. He is not investing in a stock because he wants to hold it, but because once having paid top price for it, he can't get out without a loss. The novices in Wall Street are always buying at the top and getting sold out at the bottom. Cynical professional traders say the street meaning the rank and file of speculators who fill the commission houses, is always wrong. One well-known plunger said he made his fortune by doing exactly the opposite in the market of what everybody else was doing. The stock market is most dangerous when it looks the best. When stocks are making sensational advances, it, it, it means that pools are throwing out smoke screens to cover their selling and that the lambs are tumbling over one another in an effort to swallow the bait and hook. This is the time to sell, not buy. The time to buy is when everything looks black and nobody wants stocks. Then the trader can buy at his own price. Just imagine if company X that everybody loves and stock price per share was really higher. Like I don't even have any Tesla because I'm kind of starting my new strategy at ground zero, basically pulling along one red position. I have six positions. Some days, three of the six are green. It's been a few weeks. It's been a few weeks when, since four of the six were green. And I think at one point I had five of the six were green. Uh... But since then, most of them have fallen behind. Um, but you got to remember, everyone's selling. So the market's going down, okay? Luckily, I'm not one of those people that invested all my money at the all-time highs because I thought it wasn't ever going to stop. Um... I change my strategy at the right time in my mind to start accumulating long term towards the bottom or as we are getting to the bottom because we don't know where the bottom is yet but I've been accumulating on my way down because once this mess is all cleared up the market naturally doesn't keep going down it's going to rebound and hopefully my buys on the way down will show a benefit on the way back up or as it goes up um, so the phrase you know buy when people are fearful that's what that means when people are selling and you see that a stock price is below true value you need to start accumulating don't buy all at once just a little bit here and there i try to only buy on red days but sometimes i buy on green days on a dip uh, i just can't help myself right i need to get more disciplined to only buy on red days or when the price is below a certain level you know i need to learn to wait for that moment to come. Uh, one company uh, 
the gentleman who started the Discord I'm on, I referred to him as Sensei, uh, one company that's on our long-term hit list, um, you know, he says in, in, you know, five to 20 years, this could be a $450 a share of stock. So does it really matter if you're buying it at $9 or $10? Does it really matter? Because uh, eventually you're going to have to settle to not just DCA down. You have to learn how to DCA, DCA up. Uh, because you can't miss the bus waiting to DCA down because you never know how a stock's going to react. It could just gradually go up and not really have any downs. The time to buy is when everything looks black and nobody wants stocks. Then the trader can buy at his own price. Buying should not be done in a hurry. There is usually plenty of time to buy good stocks. If there seems to be need for haste, the time is not ripe for bargain hunting. The market moves up slowly, but it goes down fast. The crash of 1929, a year's advance, was wiped out in almost two weeks. Okay, well, we've, some, we've seen plenty of stocks currently that have gone down below year-over-year's level already, uh, but it's taken a while. Okay, it didn't just take two weeks. It, it took months. It's a, been a slow bleed. Um, the stock market actually is a barometer of business, credit, and world affairs. It moves in cycles covering periods of three years or more. But sometimes the working of these cycles is halted temporarily by speculation based on current happenings. It is not always easy to discern whether it is a bull or a bear market. Prices move up and down in wide swings over long periods, but between these extreme points, there will be many shorter swings, or the market will move sideways. The market never moves steadily one way. It does not advance over a long period without a setback now and again. We are in a setback. And it does not decline without periodical rallies, which I've been seeing that. Last week was one indication, but it was crazy that there was five rally days. Uh, previous to that, for about a week or two, it was... Uh, a rally pre-market and then sell off during market open uh, or one day was a rally and the next day was a sell off it you know so there it's sort of like it going sideways uh, but does not decline without periodical rallies the setbacks or reactions in bull markets occur when the market becomes overbought at high prices this is the signal for the bears to begin raiding the temporary rallies in bear markets are caused when the market becomes oversold. Then the bear traders whose selling helped bring about the decline rush to cover. And bull traders buy for a quick turn. Let's read that again. Then the bear traders whose selling helped bring about the decline rush to cover. And bull traders buy for a quick turn. The wise speculator who buys for the long pull or to catch the major swings pays no heed to the temporary conditions described, the daily movement. The long puller doesn't give two shits about the long uh, about the daily movement, or shouldn't. Uh, he bought his stock at a low price originally, hopefully, and he intends holding it for a long time until his profit is substantially enough to take. you got to be patient. We got to be patient as small retail traders. If you're like me, all right, you're not a millionaire. You don't do this for a living. You're just putting 3% of your check in every week into companies that you believe will give you a, a nice profit when you're ready. Uh, if you're like me, you need to try and follow the rules because if you don't follow the rules, you're going to lose. I lost the first year and a half of my trading career. I lost. Okay. Um, 
Okay, I had to file, you know, last two income tax filings. I didn't get any taxes, you know, because I lost each year. So, or maybe it was just one year. I don't know. But I owed no taxes because I had no, I had no profits. Um, all the, de all the deflation and values in the stock market in the fall of 1929, never endangered properly invested capital. Good stocks declined with the bad during the break, but when the pressure was relieved, the good stocks snapped right back. Free cash flow is important. If you, if you're invested in companies that are in debt, they may not recover. Um, traders who carried more good stocks than they could afford to buy had to suffer with the speculators who were loaded up with poor issues. This was the penalty they paid for overextension. Buying too much stock is a cardinal sin in Wall Street. Unless the speculator was forced to sell to lighten his margin account, he was not hurt in the break. Those speculators who knew the rules of Wall Street and held good stocks that they could buy outright, if necessary, sat back and watched events as interested spectators because they were just patient it wasn't money they needed and they knew it was they were good stocks and they would come back no matter how good a stock is it is certain to fluctuate in price these minor fluctuations mean nothing the only factors that could make a corporation stock worth more such as increased business expansion of operations, increased earnings, changes of management, and developments of major importance don't happen overnight nor every day of the week. Let's go over that again because that's exactly where we are today, a hundred years later. The only factors that could make a corporation stock worth more, such as increased business, expansion of operations, increased earnings, changes of management, and developments of major importance don't happen overnight nor every day of the week. Only over long periods can a stock be expected to really increase in intrinsic worth. It is not common sense to believe that a stock could be worth, say, $100 today and $125 tomorrow. These fluctuations are caused by pool manipulation and public speculation and should not interest the spe speculator who has bought intelligently, and I'm going to add, for the long pool. All buying in the stock market must be done on an intelligent plan and according to rules. The man who pursues one policy one day and another the next is going to run into trouble. You have to stay consistent. <clears throat> you can't change your plan on a daily basis. <clears throat> a horde of unintelligent speculators plunge into the market without forethought and without plans. They operate blindly and blame Wall Street for their own mistakes. They are buying when the professionals are selling and selling when Wall Street is buying. The stock exchanges cannot be blamed for the woes of speculators. They don't approve or disapprove of speculation. They simply provide a convenience meeting place for people who want to buy and sell stock. A story is told of a man who wanted to be constantly in the market and asked his brokers to tip him off on anything good. One day, the Federal Reserve Bank rediscount redis rate was raised to 5%. The broker sent a telegram to his customer. Bank rate up 5. Back came a telegram from the customer. Buy me a thousand shares. This is how numerous speculators op This is how numerous speculators operate, and the foolish, reckless policy was responsible for losses of approximately four billion dollars in the great 1929 depression depression now just google you know what's four billion dollars worth today quite a damn bit was lost during the crash of 1929 people suffered the agony of financial loss and many had to start life over again because they would not take the trouble to learn the rules of the game they were playing it's not easy to know when to buy stock the daily fluctuation of prices is confusing destroying their true value it is not easy, even for the professional, Wall Street, to figure the exact value of a stock. There are many intangible elements to be reckoned with. 
The purchaser of Kalman stock becomes a partner in the corporation, and he shares in the success or failure of the business. Often in the liquidation of a company, there is nothing left for the common stockholder. On the other hand, the common shares of many of the large corporations have large assets behind them and are immensely valuable. The size of the corporation, the nature of its business, its position in its particular sector, the book value of the company's assets, the capitalization ahead of the common stock, the dividends paid, the company's present and future prospects, all have to be considered in figuring the value of common stock. This problem is too intricate for the average trader who must rely upon a good statistical agency to figure it out for him. It must be borne in mind that the stock has a true value and somebody knows what that value is regardless of market price. Sometimes a rough idea of the value of a stock can be gained by a study of the high and low prices of the year and previous years, but rough estimates are not advisable. It is impossible to pick the extreme low price or the extreme high price. If you come close to either of those points, you are very clever. The Japanese have a proverb which means that they are always satisfied with 75%. This is a good proverb for small speculators to keep in mind. Nothing is gained by trying to gain 100% profit in the stock market. Don't be greedy. When you have a satisfactory reward for your skill and patience, take your profit and be satisfied. Many speculators hang on to their stocks too long, believing that if they can make 20 points, they can just as easily make 100. There is danger in waiting for the last eighth. When a stock becomes inflated, every point up increases the danger of a sudden break. Traders sometimes make up their minds to sell at a certain point. When the stock reaches that point, everything looks so rosy that they decide to postpone selling. They usually overstay their market. In buying stock, make the investigation before the purchase and not after. The right time to buy is after a decline, but be sure the decline is over. After the first crash last fall, thousands of speculators rushed in to buy stocks, believing the storm had passed. This crop of buyers had the heaviest losses. The second crash was worse than the first. After a bad smash, the stock market does not recover from the shock immediately. Sometimes it takes months to regain the vitality to move upward again. These dull periods after declines are the ideal buying times when bankers and large operators accumulate stock. We use the same wordage today. Try and wrap this up. Generally, a stock will find its correct level in the market. It may sell above its worth for a time or perhaps a little below, but in the end, the market's estimate will be fairly accurate. The business of the spectator, a speculator, is to make a thorough study of the stock he intends to buy and by watching its market action decide for himself where the level of true worth is. Having decided this, let him wait patiently until the stock sells at his price before buying. It will get there in time. You know, nowadays we have uh, access to all of the data, financial information of a company. So it's easier to ascertain the true value of a company. Uh, So, you know, you get a better idea of where, where you want to be, where you want the price to be in order for you to buy, because you want it to be below what you feel it's worth. Case in point, I bought this book at a yard sale. Actually, it was a uh, antiques festival in some town near State College. And... Uh, she wanted eight dollars for it and i asked her if she'd take less and so i paid six so i wouldn't have done that but my wife was like ask, ask if she'll take less so i did and so uh i got it for six bucks so let's just say the true value of the book is eight dollars and i bought it for six and say it's an antique next year the true value is is uh nine dollars since i read it i could choose to sell it and i could sell it for nine dollars and so i would make three dollars right because i paid six and i sold it for nine sort of the same thing think of this as a stock you buy this share 
uh, you know, it's, it's trading at $8 and somebody has a, a, a sell order in for, you know, $6 for some reason. Or I put a buy order in for $6 and someone goes, all right, I'll sell it to you for $6. Okay. So I got it so automatically. I'm $2 up. Why they would do that, I don't know. But, um, you know, maybe they're a bear. Maybe they're thinking it's going to go down. Uh, but, and then the price comes back up and it passes eight and goes to nine. I could sell it for nine and I just made three bucks. I don't know why I'm saying this because you know how it works. But I just thought it was a pretty cool example that I got a better deal on a book about getting a deal. If the trader has a fairly accurate knowledge of the value of stock when he buys, he must have some notion of what would be a fair price for him to sell at without expecting miracles to happen. The speculator who bought when everyone was selling is pretty sure of a profit if he sells when everybody is buying. This is a very simple rule, but workable. When a trader has broken the rules and purchased pool stock at inflated prices, he should sell it as soon as he finds out his mistake. Better take a small loss immediately than hold on to second or third rate stocks for a long period only to sell them in the end at a bigger loss. It takes courage to take a loss deliberately, but it is the wise thing to do if you are wrong. Many traders get hooked in low-grade stocks at high prices and doggedly hold on to them in the vain hope that they will come back. Don't try to outguess the market. It can't be done. About 15 million people in this country are trading in stocks as of 1930. They're buying and selling, mostly ill-advised, changes the market from day to day. You can't hope to gauge their hopes and fears. Mm -hmm. Short selling at the market. As the market falls faster than it goes up, the bear, market, the bear makes quicker and larger profits than the bull, but he takes many more risks. When a bull trader buys a stock, he knows how far it can fall, no lower than zero. A bear trader who sells short must cover his commitment someday does not know how far a stock can go up. If he is unle unlucky enough to sell a closely held stock that is cornered, he may have to cover at a fantastic price and suffer heavy losses. The bulls have many tricks to encourage the bearers to sell stocks short with the idea of trapping them and running the market up on their covering operations. Enormous fortunes have been made quickly on the short side of the market, but Wall Street history records few of them that were ever retained. The trader who feels he must have the experience of selling stock short had better make sure that he is selling a widely held stock that will be easy to buy back. If he is not careful, he will sell into a bag from which he cannot escape. Knowing the risks of the short side, brokers do not encourage amateur traders to operate on that side of the market. Leave short selling to the professionals. The system of averaging to a lower to lower the cost price of a stock that has declined after the trader bought it is safe only under certain conditions. Suppose a trader bought back bought stock at $100 share and has declined to $90. He can lower his net loss and make quickly and more quickly get into a profitable position by taking on additional stock at the lower price. This practice is, is advisable only if the trader is certain that he has a good stock that was cheap when he bought it originally, then the decline simply offers him a good opportunity to pick up a, uh, a bargain. He must be sure that in taking on the additional stock, he is not overloading his account. If the stock purchased originally was of doubtful value, to buy more is to get deeper in the hole, particularly as there is no guarantee that the stock will co not continue to, to decline. Pyramiding. The trader who pyramids his profits is undertaking one of the most speculative ventures in the market. This is done by purchasing additional stock on paper profits. So if you have a margin account <coughs> and you currently have profits from that account, but not actual realized profits, and you're purchasing additional stock on those unrealized profits, the system is permitted by brokers, but the operator doing it is watched closely for margin. Traders who pyramid must be absolutely certain that a big rise is due in the stock. They are building up a house of cards that could easily collapse. It is an all or nothing proposition not recommended for the amateur trader. Profits on the long pool. The speculator who finds permanent success in the stock market 
is the one who buys good stocks and refuses to be shaken out by market upheavals. But he must buy right in the first place. The only supreme confidence in his investment, justified by statistics, will enable the tyro to prevail against the fears, uncertainties, and temptations that are certain to come in the mar uh, stock market over a period of years. Sure, money is made slowly in stocks. If you hear of a friend getting rich quickly by active trading in stocks, don't envy him and don't try to emulate him. Wish him luck. He needs it. It is the only slender reed he has to depend on. The day will surely come when luck will desert him, and it will desert him in the, his weakest moment when his capital is stretched to the utmost on top of the market. Um, let me go through a few examples of uh, buying shares, receiving dividends, um, selling an option and closing it, then selling the shares in the end, and then what your total profit was from the original purchase price with the additional income of dividends and options. Uh, so just a quick American Telephone and Telegram, 10 shares, March 1920 for $970. Regular dividends received $867.50. Five offerings of rights, $330.75. Total dividends and rights, $1,198. Selling price of those 10 shares, March 1930, 10 years later, $2,467 for a total profit of $3,665.75 on a $970 investment. It tells you where to go for information. All we got to do is look on the internet now. Um, Dictionary of Wall Street Terms. I just want to go over a few that uh, we use today. Uh, bear, a trader who believes the market is too high because of unfavorable conditions. Bear operators borrow stock to sell at prevailing prices, hoping to make a profit by purchasing later at a lower price. Boiler Shop, the telephone nest of a stock swindler. Here, young men are trained in high-pressure selling methods. By dynamic talks on the telephone, they are able to sell large amounts of worthless stock to people they have never seen. Bucketing. The illegal practice of buying and selling stock on paper without any actual transaction. The broker sells or buys against his customer's orders. That's a way for the broker to make some extra cash. Uh, let me just go over this, because on my platform, my uh, trading platform, I just discovered that I was enrolled in a stock lending program because under my all profit and loss list, it showed I had uh, two cents paid to me through interest earned. I'm like, what the hell is that? So I click on it and here I'm, I'm enrolled in the uh, stock lending program. And I went through the history. None had been lend, lended out this year that I know of, unless you don't know that until next year. But as far as 2021, uh, I lent out one of my positions uh, half a dozen times. Okay. So the hedge funds could short, or whoever borrowed my shares could short my stock that I'm holding. And they only pay me two cents. Um, there was probably four or five other stocks I was holding at one time that they borrowed to short. And so I exited out of that program. All right. And two cents, number one, isn't worth it. And number two, I don't want you shorting my stock. So I'm not going to let you use my shares. So traders who sell short have to borrow stock from somebody else. All stock must be delivered the next day. The broker who borrows the stock pays the market price for it. He has the privilege of returning it at the same price. The lender can demand the return of the stock at any time. No one gave me that opportunity. Flyer. A plunge into the stock market on impulse. A dangerous gamble with the odds against you. Um, floating supply, the stock in circulation, 
in Wall Street brokerage houses, the stock readily obtainable for speculative purposes. Holding the bag. We know what that means. Inflation. Stocks that are selling above their intrinsic worth are said to be inflated. Uh, do, 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 do. Kidding. Pushing stocks to unwarranted high levels. Kiting. Kiting. Manipulation. Controlling the movements of stocks by artificial methods. This is mostly done to attract the public and to unload stocks. Lamb. A greenhorn or inexperienced trader. Odd lot. Any order under 100 shares. We don't refer to that anymore. At least, I guess not in the retail world. Uh, maybe the big guys do. Milking. When unscrupulous officers and directors of corporations pay themselves exorbitant salaries and squeeze all the money they can out of the treasury, it is called milking the company. Melon, a bonus or division of profits by a corporation to its stockholders. Plunger, one who speculates wildly and without forethought. Paper profits, the stuff dreams are made of. These are profits that show for the moment on the broker's books, but before the stock is sold out, may disappear or be turned into a loss. A profit is only a profit when the cash is in hand. It is a bad practice to spend paper profits. All right, real quick, the golden rules. Pay all bills before speculating. Don't speculate with another person's money. Don't neglect your business to speculate. If the market makes you irritable or interferes with sleep, you are wrong. Don't use in the market money that you need for other purposes. <clears throat> Don't go joint account with a friend. Play a loan hand. Don't give a broker discretionary powers if you can't run your own account. Leave the market alone. The broker who demands a large margin is your friend. Only a bucket shop wants you to trade on a slender margin. <clears throat> Don't buy more stock than you can safely carry. Overtrading means forced selling and losses. Get accurate information. Demand facts, not opinions. It's important. Not opinions. You need facts. Don't take advice from uninformed people. They know no more than you about the market. Such advice as, I think well of it, or it is a cinch, means nothing. Use only a part of your capital in speculation. Don't buy cats and dogs or unseasoned stocks. Buy good standard stocks that have stood the test of time. Remember that good stocks always come back. Unknown stocks may disappear. Don't buy in a hurry. There is plenty of time to buy good stock. Investigate each stock thoroughly before you buy. Remember that it is easier to buy than to sell. The saleability of a stock is very important. The market moves up slowly, but goes down fast. Be prepared to buy your stock outright if necessary, if you're on margin. If you can't do this, you are taking chances. Buy in a selling market when nobody wants stock. Sell in a buying market when everybody wants stock. The market is most dangerous when it looks best. It is not. It is most inviting when it looks worst. Don't get too active. Many trades, many losses. Long pull trades are most most profitable. Don't try to outguess the market. Look out for the buying fever. It is a dangerous disease. Don't try to pick the top and the bottom of the market. <clears throat> Don't dream in the stock market. Have some idea just how far your stock can go. Remember that the majority of traders are always buying at the top and selling at the bottom. Don't worry over the profits you might have made. You might have made. Don't spend your paper profits. They might turn into losses. Watch the news. Remember that the market actually is a barometer of business and credit. Don't buy fads or novelties. Be sure the company you are becoming a partner in makes something everybody wants. Don't finance new inventions unless you are healthy. Wealthy. Don't finance new inventions unless you are wealthy. Ask who manages the company whose stock you want to buy. Don't follow pool operations. The pools are out to get you. Don't listen to or give tips. Good tips are scarce and they take a long time to materialize. Don't take flyers. Don't treat your losses lightly. They are serious. You are losing actual currency. When you win, don't get reckless. Put your winnings in the bank for a while. Don't talk about the market. You will attract too much idle gossip. Sniff it inside information. It is usually bunk. The big people don't talk about their operations. Don't speculate unless you have plenty of time to think about it. Fortunes are not easily made in Wall Street. Some professionals give their lives to the market and die poor. There is such a thing as luck, but it does not hold all the time. 
Don't pyramid. Don't average unless you are sure you know your stock. Don't buy more stock than you can afford just to look big. If you are a 10 share man, don't be ashamed of it. Be aware of a stock that is given an abundance of publicity. Use your mistakes as object lessons. The person who makes the same mistake twice deserves no sympathy. Don't open an account at the brokers just to oblige a friend. Remember that many people believe they can find better use for your money than you can yourself. Leave short selling to experienced professionals. If you must sell short, pick a widely held stock or you may get caught in a corner. Money made easily in the market is never valued. Easy come, easy go. Don't blame the stock exchange for your own mistakes. Don't shape your financial policy on what your, what your uh, barber advises. Hundreds of experts are waiting to give you exact information. Don't let emotion or prejudice warp your judgment. Base your operations on facts. So, for, for the most part, you know, I really enjoyed this book. It was only 97 pages. Um, gave, gave, you know, really actually good advice. It covered a lot of things that are pertinent for today. Um, I wish I knew who Frank J. Williams was. Um, maybe some of you can tell me. Because um, I, in quick search on the internet, I couldn't find anything other than a, a recent... Uh, Supreme Court judge or judge of some kind. Uh, but <clears throat> I hope you learned something. If anything, uh, you know, buy this book digitally. It's old. It's published in 1930. I think there was a reprint. Uh, has a different cover. Um, you can check it out. I mean, I just think it's pretty cool. I just happened to see it. And I'm interested in, in the stock market, so I picked it up for six bucks. If you watch this video, uh, thank you for watching. Um, I wanted to share this book with some friends of mine. I wasn't really sure how to do it because they're not local. Um, so I figured I'd just go over this book real quick through video. Probably could have done a, a better job. But um, the point is, you know, learn what you can about the market uh, try to follow the rules all the time if you can follow the rules if you can build a strategy that works for you like you know what do you want to do okay D do you you want to retire early you know how old are you now figure out how much money you can start to to, to put into the, to the market accumulating shares of some companies that you've done research on that you believe are strong companies and have some uh, growth potential that they can <clears throat> return a profit to you when you need it because uh, you're loaning them your money. You, when you buy a share, you're loaning them your money. And a lot of companies use the money they get from shareholders to uh, grow uh, or in bad times keep the company going, you know, through a recession. Um, so, you know, you, you, you expect a return on that and you also own part of that company, a piece. Um, I didn't get into stocks at all until, you know, like I said, April of 2020. So, um, I wish I would have learned this stuff a long time ago. I wouldn't be working today, probably. But um, anyhow, if you have any comments, let me know. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you later.